This past Sunday, uh, two Sundays ago, uh, we had some folks who were at the Sunday Minion that meet in the Beit Midrash come and join the Beit Sefer group um, to talk a little bit about adults praying and talking about talits and then these things that they wear on their arms and on their head called tefillin. And one of the people who joined us didn't bring his tefillin, so he said, can I borrow yours? And I said, sure. And the tefillin I have is just like any other tefillin, but there's something special about that tefillin, and it was given to me by a mentor of mine, which was given to him by a mentor of his. So there's three generations of cantors, not related to the Kotler cantors, but different cantors. It's just an object. It's just a ritual object. But there is such significance to me because someone who was influential to him, this cantor that mentored me, gave it to him, and then he gave it to me. And so I, while I don't really wear it very regularly, it's special. And it's not something intrinsic because of the object itself, but because of this extrinsic properties um, that I hold onto it. And that's kind of how I feel about Violins of Hope. It's just an instrument like any other, but there's a deeper significance and a deeper impact that these instruments have, um, and we'll hear about that in just a little bit. Um, I first want to acknowledge uh, Ellen Feldman, uh, who brought this organization to my attention. I'd never heard of them, and she um, was instrumental, I guess you could say, <laughs> um, uh, in bringing it to my attention and, and making this happen. So thank you so much, uh, Ellen. I'll give you a little context about Violins of, of Hope, and then I'll invite uh, Perry to speak about it, and then Linda, who will be our violinist. Um, Violins of Hope was started by a father and son uh, based in Tel Aviv, luthiers. They were violin makers and repairers and had the inspiration and initiative to collect and gather violins that survived the Holocaust. These were all instruments who were owned at one point by um, a Jew who um, either made it out or in, in many cases did not make it out of the Holocaust. And um, some of them look like any ordinary violin you might see in a shop, and some of them have very intricate designs and inlays and Jewish stars built into them. Um, so as you hear about these instruments and as you listen to the instrument itself, uh, I hope you will find that in the instrument itself, just the simple wood and string, that there is such uh, a deep and storied rich history in each of these instruments. Um, and we have the, the great pleasure to, uh, to hear one. And, and each of the instruments is very cool. Uh, they, they send me before we had the, they joined us last Sunday and today they sent, the uh, Violins of Hope sent me um, like a little information thing about each of the violins with uh, when it was made and who owned it and where they were from. And so each of these violins has their own stories and we're about to hear one. A little bit about uh, Violins of Hope. You want to um, the father and son luthier team, Amnon and Avshai Feinstein, uh, had settled, uh, the father had settled in Israel in the 30s. And there was an effort in the 1930s to bring European Jewish uh, musicians over because of all the problems in Europe in the, as early as the 30s. And they started a Palestine, the Palestine Orchestra, which later became the Israeli Philharmonic. Uh, many of those musicians, oh, many of those musicians, uh, had German-made violins, and often they came to the store in Tel Aviv and said uh, they wanted to sell the violin, or they destroy it because they didn't want it because of the ger German lineage. And I'm known wound up collecting a number of these violins over the years and kept them around the shop. He couldn't sell them. They weren't uh, of, uh, uh, especially the German ones, of value to other Israelis. Uh, it was only later that they, uh, when they had an intern from Dresden, and he, that the intern had them speak in Germany to talk about their lineage, that uh, 
uh, it, it, it began to gather steam. And then later in, in Israel in the 60s, uh, or 50s and 60s, survivors would uh, get on the radio often to try to find other family members that were dislocated because they didn't catch up. So uh, Amnon got on as well to talk about uh, the violins. And each one has a different story in terms of uh, getting to the shop. Uh, not all of them are of great value. A lot of them, uh, like they were saying, have ornamentation, which was uh, typical of the klezmer working violinists that would uh, play at weddings and such. Um, G the JCC looked at this as a opportunity to, which dovetails with its, its uh, mission to find shared communal Jewish um, experience for the J Chicago Jewish community. And that's why we're uh, bringing, brought the violins and they'll be here up until the high holidays in at various programs. Uh, this particular violin uh, is called the Hecht violin. It was owned by a violinist named Fanny Hecht. Uh, her and her husband um, moved from Germany to Amsterdam with her two sons. And uh, she played and had befriended a Christian woman in Amsterdam. And as things were getting worse, she gave the violin to her neighbor, um, and uh, Helena uh, Visser. Visser. And uh, eventually, the, the family was deported uh, out of Amsterdam to Germany and wound up all four of the family, the, the two sons and the Fanny and her husband uh, passed away in, at um, Auschwitz in, uh, in, uh, in the Holocaust. Later, uh, Helena came to Israel and went to Yad Vashem and uh, looked up the lineage and found that there wasn't anyone left and donated the violin to the uh, uh, Amnon and uh, Avshai Weinstein at their, at their shop. Uh, this was a, a very fine instrument. I, I believe it was indicated as a, a Stradivarius from the 1700s. I'll, I'll talk about okay, that. I'll let you. I'll, I'll pass it to Linda and, and to talk about her piece. piece. This is actually my second encounter with this with this violin. Uh, when I opened up the case this morning, I said, oh, we're back together again. <laughs> so that's very, very wonderful. Um, even though this violin has a label in it that's, that says that it's a Stradivarius made in 1743, if you were to go to any music shop in Chicago and buy a student instrument, you'd find a lot of those. So it's not a Stradivarius, <laughs> okay? But it is a beautiful survivor. And um, I think it is, it's really an honor for me to play this instrument, to play all of these instruments. I've, I've played about 10 of them so far, and I hope to play more of them. Um, the Hechts all perished in uh, I think three of them perished in 1943, and then the youngest son in 1945 in a labor camp. And then this violin was silent for 74 years until it was restored. And just like when you hear the voice of a loved one, it's unique and you know it instantly. Um, so I would like to play three short pieces for you. The first is Eli Eli, and um, this was written by 23-year-old Hannah Senesch, brave, steadfast young woman who, in an effort to do something to stand up against the madness, flew from Israel parachuted into Hungary, was quickly captured and tortured for months, and facing her execution, refused a blindfold. Her poem, Eli Eli, and actually I keep a copy of Eli Eli in my violin case. It's, my God, my God, may these never end. The sand and the sea, 
the rustle of the water, the lightning of the heavens, the prayer of man. Thank you. The next piece that I have for you, it's, it's actually a traditional Ukrainian Jewish tune. And it just, uh, it's, I don't know the words in Ukrainian, um, but it, it translates as cry of Israel. And apparently, and there's a very sad story about it. Originally, this was played at weddings that, you know, even though it is kind of a sad sounding tune, um, often our, our music is a little tinged with a little, just a reminder that even in joy, you get both. And then, um, so this was a, in, in the Ukrainian Jewish community, this was very popular. This was like the big, the big tune at, at every wedding. When the bad times came, and the Nazis came in, and they rounded up the Jews, there was a prominent clarinetist in the community, and as people were being lined up and shot, they forced this clarinetist to play this tune, Cry of Israel.
I first became interested in music composed both in the camps and by composers murdered in the Shah about about 12 years ago uh, through violinist Daniel Hope. He came out with uh, a CD that was called Forbidden Music. And the last piece on, on that CD was the, uh, the Kaddish by Maurice Ravel, which is originally a vocal piece. And uh, Daniel Hope, he's a, um, actually, I think he's originally Austrian, but has lived most of his life in, in, in England. He chose to do it, to play it unaccompanied, just the violin. And I remember sitting in a parking lot just melting, melting with tears. And I reached out to Daniel Hope and I said, you know, what is that? What, what, what is this piece? And um, since then, I've uh, I play this uh, for my on every Yom Kippur in memory, and on every Yom Hashoah in memory. It's the Ravel Kaddish.
So they have uh, graciously agreed to answer questions. Um, so I'll ask the question, I'll, I'll start, because I had a question that I already asked, and I think it's a, a good one, so I'll ask it again. And that is, um, of all these violins, do they come in, uh, like, are, like are, are some of them nicer than others? Are some of them, like, as you mentioned, that they're student violins and others are probably quite nice? Like, what's the, the range in terms of quality of violins that you have in the collection? Yes. <laughs> there, is a, there, there is a range. Um, so some of the instruments in the collection could be used like in the concert hall with, with concertos, with recitals. Others are either, maybe they were student instruments or, don't take this the wrong way, but like a street violin or something that was used for weddings or for folk music. Okay, more a, a, a casual violin, not necessarily a concert instrument. It doesn't mean that they're any less special, but um, you know, th this particular violin, um, I, it's, not, it's not really a, con a concert instrument, but it is, I, I've grown to really love the sound of it. Um, Violins have a way, I'm sorry to detract. Go um, violins have a way of revealing more and more details to you the more that you have your hands on it and, and the more you touch it. As Perry was speaking, my thumb went along the back of the scroll and I noticed that there was, that there was some decoration on it. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a little hard to tell what that is, but, but there's something there. Um, on, but on every instrument, it's just, it's just like getting to know a, another human being. It keeps revealing more and more things. And the closer you get to an instrument, the more you love those little weird things that you come across. So, did you see that? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, many of the instruments... Um, are some, some we know where they came from and who owned them. Uh, many of them they don't know, uh, but they know they came from uh, Klezmarim, particularly the ones that are decorated with uh, Mogan David and so on. Uh, and uh, Amnon, uh, the father who, uh, of the luthier in, in Tel Aviv, uh, his, um, his grandfather was also a, a luthier and actually perished uh, in the Holocaust. Uh, later, they made a movie, uh, Defiance, uh, which was they lived in the forest. And, but it, at the end of the, it, in the end, he lost his entire family. And so it, it's been a passion of love for Amnon and Avshai and, and taking in these instruments. I think at this point, there are over 100 instruments. And he, each one, like I said, has, its, has a soul of sorts and, and is a remembrance for uh, the, so many Jews who were lost in, in unmarked graves, and uh, he, he himself can't, doesn't know where his family is, and this is a connection for him as well and a labor of love. And one of the things before I, I open for questions that, that really struck me when Linda arrived um, before services, uh, and we were talking about the violin itself, and I said, tell me about this, this violin. I mean, is it made in Italy or what? And she says, it just screams. She says, she told me what she shared with you, that it has a Stradivarius, which is you know, made in Italy, if it was really a Stradivarius. But she says, it just screams German to me. And it's, it's so telling because anybody who's a musician will tell you that certain instruments just have a certain feel or a vibe. And you'll have your own proclivity to, you know, I like this versus this. But every instrument um, is unique, especially when it's something tailored and handmade like that. So it's just very special and unique when, when people talk about, oh, this one has a soul. I mean, it's part of, you know, what adds the character to that particular instrument. Yeah. Yo, lo, ho, 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 let me give you a mic. I have such a loud voice. I didn't think Fair I needed enough. this. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, did any instruments end up coming literally out of the camps? In other words, did they, you know, when people were put on trains or whatever to the camps, did they take a violin and they, any of them were recovered actually from a camp? Oh, there were many violins that were used in the camps. Uh, in, in many cases, the, the Germans wanted to uh, have ensembles 
uh, either as, as people were going out to work or coming back from work, uh, they were used as in labor themselves as musicians. And that's why many of them actually after they left and got out of the camps, looked at it as a uh, part of the oppression and right. didn't get back to these instruments. So many of these instruments were sitting for 60, 70, 80 years before they were uh, picked up and, and brought back to life. I have a little, a little more to say about that. Um, you might remember the, the movie Playing for Time from, I think that was made in the 70s with uh, Vanessa Redgrave. And so many of the camps had such orchestras. Actually, uh, Mahler's, Gustav Mahler's daughter-in-law was part of that orchestra and uh, not that same orchestra, but you know she she was a she had been a concert violinist, and then up until up until her death she um, she caught typhus and 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 died. Um, she played till the end. At Theresienstadt, there was a huge musical life. A lot of the pieces written during the Shoah were written at Territsen. And so, the, I mean, there were full orchestras. So I don't know if uh, any of the instruments in the collection came through Territsen, but yeah, so it's... The JCC about uh, six or seven years ago did a program with the CSO where they played the Verdi Requiem, which was played in Ternstadt, and it was, it, it was set up as like a showpiece to the Red Cross to convince the international community that, that they were, that these were actually uh, um, treating, that they were treating everyone properly and so on. Uh, and the Verdi Requiem was uh, particularly uh, of interest to the prisoners because it's 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 uh, in Italian, but it's it's telling uh, their captors that they're going going to have to pay for what they did. How many violins are in the collection, and how many are being taken around on tour? I believe there's on the order of uh, 60 on tour here in Chicago. Uh, I think there's over 130 total, and they're always being found. In fact, uh, there was just one found and, and donated here in Chicago, which will, is going to be restored. Uh, they make their way through various routes. Uh, that's about, about, about 130 at this point. So were the violins intact and in, for, you know, in, in full condition when they were brought in, or did many of them need repair? Oh, many of them needed a lot of repair, yeah. Being wooden instruments, violins need a lot, violins are finicky. And um, like any, any violin needs a couple of times a year being really taken care and given a spa day. But so these instruments that hadn't, and when an instrument is not played, it, it shrinks and it's, it's not as healthy. So it requires a lot of restoration and also just being in the elements. I mean, the elements of a closet or a basement or just, and again, not being played. Cracks open, uh, cracks open up, seams open up. Um, this is just glued together. So there, it really takes a lot of restoration. Um, I mean, trust me, Chicago winters do a number on violins. Chicago summers do a number on violins. So. Yeah, and many of these, again, were instruments played by a klezmerim, and some of them, they, they weren't in great uh, environments for, for, for their wood to begin with. And some of them were repaired in inappropriate ways, even with, is it some, some even, they even found some that were nailed together where they shouldn't be and so on. Um, yeah, but before I take a question, I just want to point out uh, in terms of the, the quality of the violin, um, one of the reasons why so many instruments are made from wood is that they resonate and are able to project. So this violin was not amplified at all. There was no mic on it, and it was like 10 times louder 
than my guitar. I don't know if you, if you picked up on that, but I was concerned people online wouldn't be able to hear it, but I was looking at the board, and both this mic and the handheld mic on my podium were both blipping every time she was playing because it was just so, so loud. Like my guitar, only the top part is wood. The rest is a high pressure laminate, it's just plastic. And that's why I have to plug it in, but this thing is just, it's so loud, it's beautiful. And, and it, that's from only about a pound of, uh, it only weighs about a pound. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, uh, yeah. This isn't a question, I just wanted to add, we also went up to North Shore Congregation Israel to the opening concert, and what struck me there and what strikes me here is that all these years later, they're in a synagogue, and it, it just really moves me. Thank you very, I know there's more questions, but thank you for, for sharing that with us, because to have them here, it just blows my mind. Yeah. It can't be any. I was just curious about one other thing. Were there any other instruments other than just violins that ended up getting recovered out of camps or the Shaw? There are a few, and, and in fact, at the uh, in Glencoe, they they had a, um, a cello that was uh, recovered as well, and a viola. Yeah, it's just that uh, the violin was the most common instrument for for Jews. You know, like it's it's hard to take your cello. Uh, when you're on the run. <laughs> Maybe that would be a future exhibit of the Clarinets of Hope. Um, just a couple quick questions. First of all, do you have any idea if this was made by one maker or, and also uh, where in Germany and what period you think it's from, like Merchikirchen or something like that? Well, um, just given the condition of it and, and the, and, um, I would say in the, the Mittenwald area and probably late 19th century. That's my very unexpert opinion on, on, on these things, but that's where a lot of the German instruments were made, uh, pretty much either around the Mittenwald region or um, very close to what is, uh, um, uh, actually, Gerard, what was the name of the town in? It, it wasn't not very far from Pilsen, where we where we found them. That we were driving from Pilsen in Czech Republic to we were actually going to Bayreuth, and we stopped in another town that that used to be very very famous for violin making. So both uh, and pretty much at the latter half of the 19th century. So this is probably, that was. Mm, oh, yeah, 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 Mark Neuchirche. Mark Neuchirche. Yeah. That, that's where you think it's from? Is it uh, uh, this is either from Mittenwald, uh, uh, you know, th this, uh, this says more Mittenwald to me. Or the Mittenwald? Yeah. So. Now, did you change the the setup at all? I noticed that you're using an interesting shoulder rest that comfort shoulder. Um, I, I I use it. I use the shoulder rest because my neck is too long for. <laughs> right, but I mean, did you change yeah. the chin rest or anything or any other? No, 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 no. Um, so it's uh, um, no, pretty much that's the agreement that uh, you take it out of the case and and because our every violinist uses a different shoulder rest or not at all. Um, but pretty much they're, they're set up this way um, by the Weinsteins. So. Thank you. Keep that open. Oh. I got one more. <laughs> Is that a question? Um, in addition to what we've seen here in the 
which is wonderful. And Ellen also mentioned the Evanston Symphony doing a concert that's going to have some of this on Sunday. This coming Friday at Marion at 1.30 on Friday, there's going to be another presentation um, with the violins um, and a presentation by a uh, great violinist who's going to be playing with the Evanston Symphony. She'll be there too talking about it as well on Friday. And I've got some posters here I can hand out to people on the details of it on your way out today. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Perry. So much. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, Ellen, for uh, bringing this to my attention and helping, helping make this happen. Thank you. That was really spectacular and, and really moving. And that Revel Kaddish is unbelievable. Thank you, Linda, for introducing me to that. Wow, very, very moving.